called in and future teacher reactivated um we just we're introducing a, a new title screen just to make it obvious where the old content ends and the new content begins or the re recap begins um and for those that didn't attend the last reactivated session that we uh, delivered on online learning what works we started these webinars i think in march 2017 and what we're doing this time is um revisiting and reviewing and we've kind of badged it as reactivated sessions um so they're more flipped more focused on activities and more rooted in real experience and practitioners and each time we're hoping that we've got new guest speakers as we have today um and you'll hear from them shortly there's a uh, a section on the right of the screen here that just talks you through the journeys that we've created that you can access if you've already registered there's a link there to go straight to the flip learning journey um if you haven't registered there's links to a step-by-step -step walkthrough as to how to get to those journeys um we ask you normally what you would like to most learn from this and i think lillian did a quick summary yeah um on the whole i did a quick uh, data analysis on all the statements um on the whole most people i hear evidence is the thing that wins out i think a lot of people want to see some evidence that flipped learning is something to to try out or to recommend to academics um they also want to look at uh, best practice or factors for success uh, and, and to just find out if anything new has changed in the flipped learning world in the last uh, couple of years. Um, so, and I believe we are going to cover uh, a lot of that um, through our speakers as well as the material that we've put together and uh, a new theme obviously of uh, accessibility as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to get active. So I think we are going to post the um, URL of the actual learning object so that you can access this Google form on it. So it's in the chat right now. Uh, we're going to give you a minute to uh, get to this particular slide. Okay, uh, the link will take you straight to the slide. And we'd like you to fill in this form, which basically asks if you've been a good flipped learner yourself before attending this webinar. So we're just going to give you time to fill in the Google form. Um, we forget sometimes to put some background music uh, in the back <laughs> to encourage people to... Do you want me to play my tin whistle? <laughs> yeah, we, we forget sometimes to allow people time to... Um, fill in the form without us buzzing in their ear. <laughs> Hopefully people are working through that uh, form right now and then... In the, and can we just check, Emma, you say you can't hear anything. Do you mean you, you're, you're trying to hear that music that we've just mentioned or that you can't hear us talking at all? That's um, in, ingenious of somebody has used the annotation tool to indicate no on my shared screen. Oh, right. Um, if you can't use the form, are you actually trying to type into uh, Ron's um, screen in yeah, your, it's, in it's your not, webinar? It's not this one that we're moving. It's your local copy, which is, yeah. the link is I'll put in the text chat again. Yeah, it's, it's quite easily done. Um, maybe next time we shouldn't show the form, we should kind of show the link to the form. And uh, that way people kind of almost have no choice but to um, fill that in directly. I can see that uh, we've had about 21 responses. Um, so apologies if you're halfway through typing, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, going to start to... Uh, um, looking through some of the responses. So Ron's going to quickly just get us to the point where you can go see previous responses. There you go. You've had a few more, I think, 29 responses. Is that right? 
So um, it looks like 30 responses, half and half. Half the people have done their flipped exercise and half haven't. So Ron and Alistair, what shall we do about people who haven't done their <laughs> flipped <laughs> exercise? I think find them. I think find them. Well, wasn't there that very fine print, white on white background, that said that I agree to, to be fined if I don't do it? And donations to the Alistair and Ron and Lillian Fund. <laughs> okay, so key takeaways for, for the people who have done their, their homework, as it were, some of their key takeaways uh, included um, flipping in small chunks. This is something David Reed mentioned in, in, from Southampton. Flipping in small chunks uh, to familiarize students with the practice of flipped learning can ease them into this practice. Um, and uh, how our assumptions can limit potential to move forward from Houdini, someone remembers that, uh, starting from small steps. Um, education is a risk averse environment. So, you know, I guess that's kind of like remembering to step outside of that comfort zone of not changing practice. Um, and just a reminder that students start have a different starting point from us and a different set of experiences. So we need to do a lot more explaining if we want to bring them on the flipped learning journey. Um, so yeah, um, so someone else mentions that the one hour video and additional resource is a lot of pre-learning uh, and, and, and they broke it into 20 minute chunks. Um, so yes, that's a very good point. Maybe we didn't um, create the best flipped learning activity. It's something for us to learn from and, and for yourselves to learn from as well what amount of work is suitable for a flipped learning exercise i guess that's something we can discuss later um, key reasons for not having completed the flipped exercise i forgot so sorry that's unforgivable that's fine you know at least you didn't give the excuse of a virtual dog eating the virtual homework so so that's okay um un unforeseen activities we're all very busy uh, and, and I think you'll find students are saying the same things. Um, someone says they didn't see the homework. Uh, I was busy. Sorry, teacher. I forgot. And, and to be honest, um, because we're not in the habit of doing that, um, unlike learners who should get used to the practice of what you do as a teacher, it's a one-off and therefore it is quite easy for people to kind of uh, forget to do the task. Um, so maybe we need a few more reminders, direct reminders. Is there anything we could have done to help you complete the exercise beforehand? Yes, uh, someone said, remind me, but then someone else said, there's too many emails. So that's a, a difficult thing. Uh, others said, I just need to be more organized. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's all very good. Uh, In, and interestingly, a lot of those are cultural things, aren't they? About you know, yeah, what expectations and so on. Yeah, one one thing I've uh, advised my tutors to start doing to plan for flipped learning is to book the seminar rooms a half hour before the actual class and advise students to turn up half an hour beforehand. So they start doing their flipped exercise before the tutor walks into the room. So that could be, again, it's a kind of environmental factor that could help students to succeed in flipped learning. And um, that's just a thought. Uh, we'll see how many tutors take up that idea and uh, progress with that. Okay. Thanks very much for your contributions, people, <laughs> and the confessions. And now it's over to looking at the inclusion lens because obviously accessibility is very high on people's agendas at the moment with the public sector web accessibility legislation. And it's really important, um, particularly if you're involved in e-learning, digital practice, um, teacher training, all these sorts of things, it's really important that you kind of look holistically at the opportunities that digital learning affords because it's very easy to say oh if I do it online then I have to make sure this is accessible and that's accessible and something else but if I just do a traditional chalk and talk at the front and I give people a badly photocopied scrap of paper then that's fine I get away with that so what I want us to look at is first of all what are the benefits to maximize in something like flipped learning and I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about 
how flipped learning is really nothing special. I think somebody already mentioned, um, I saw somebody saying flipped teaching is good teaching. Uh, and there's other evidence about actually it's not the flipping that's important. It's the fact that the flipping creates interactive um, engagement and activity. And that's the important bit. So benefits to maximize. And on the screen here, you can see we've picked out four benefits. It means that the very process of planning flip learning means you scaffold the learning. The, the learner knows what is going to be going on in the lesson. Um, or at least they know the gist of that. So that's really important um, for all kinds of learners in all kinds of ways, not just uh, an accessibility disability thing, but, but for everyone. It's pressure free learning because they consume the pre-session content at their own pace. It often will involve a range of media. The pre-session stimulus could be immensely varied. Um, I remember working with my students, giving my students a spreadsheet um, <clears throat> and a spreadsheet of all the earthquake uh, locations in a particular year. And then they had to sort of plot them on a, uh, use Excel to bring up a map, uh, just to plot those as a scatter graph. And suddenly the map of the world's tectonic plates appeared in front of them. So that could be a pre-session activity, a spreadsheet, a Word document to read, a PDF to read, a video to watch, and it gives people digital independence because by its nature, the content you provide beforehand is digital, therefore they can use their own assistive technologies. But looking at the other tab, what are the barriers to minimize? Well, actually, there's no new barriers that flipped learning gives you. It just gives you the same barriers that any digital a content might give you if you're not thinking through how you're going to kind of make it most inclusive. So videos with no text alternative, even if that text alternative is just a summary of the key points or captions or transcripts, if the video has got no text alternative, it's a potential barrier for some people. Um, the documents with no heading structure, meaning that people with dyslexia can't instantly click on a navigation pane or a, a bookmark pane and navigate their way instantly to the bit that they need. That can be a barrier. And if presentations have no explanatory information in the notes field, then that can be quite daunting when you look at something with lots of images on it, or even just one big iconic metaphoric image. And you'll think, what on earth was the tutor talking about when we did that bit? Because it's a few weeks later, you're revising and you can't remember and there's nothing in the notes field. So those are just general things that are general good practice that you, you need to do to minimize barriers. But it's specifically important in flipped learning because if that online content is a prerequisite then if somebody can't access it they've got a real problem and then the second thing is that where institutions are dabbling with flipped learning flipped learning is actually a brilliant fit for technology enhanced practice and can move you forward with that but that's the point where if you're beginning to engage practitioners in a new way of working and doing things online and reaping the benefits for their learners make sure you start them right. Don't get them kind of going off doing all kinds of, oh, I've done this inaccessible Prezi for you, or I've done this flip, um, flipped learning book, you know, some of these online flip books that are ridiculously inaccessible. So do use any guidance on flipped learning as an opportunity, a vehicle for invisible accessibility awareness training. So on to the next slide, I think. And this is where uh, we're delighted to have Steve Hirons from Birkbeck come and tell us about the way he's taken a part of his course and um, used flip approaches in that. So over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, by way of introduction, yeah, I am Steve Hirons from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Birkbeck College. And for those of you who don't know Birkbeck, um, we generally teach uh, mature students part-time degrees by evening study. However, that has had to change with the funding issues and we also have UCAS students but we still teach in the evening. So our classes of face-to-face -face students can be a mix of uh, young, youngsters, uh, UCAS students, plus uh, the part-time students. 
but equally all our degree programs are available for distance learning as well so we we have a meld of students in front of us um, I'm lucky in our department in the sense that we have relatively small numbers we have about between 50 and 60 per year and I only do one lecture as a flip lecture and I do that at my level five students um, because they're used to the technology and I have to be mindful that our students uh, because generally most of them work during the day possibly don't have as much free time to do the pre-sessional work. Next slide please. So why do we do the flip lecture? Um, I thought about the benefits, um, how I perceive them and um, I want to promote active learning and I think this is an ideal way of doing that. I'm also very fond of using reflection within teaching and within learning in fact so um, I'm often quizzing the students about um, what they did the week before etc and setting quizzes. Because we have um, such a, a blend of learners from people within the class, blended learners and people watching live online whilst we give those lectures, it was also about inclusivity so that the distance learners could participate fully within a lecture. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm actually giving it, presenting it to the face-to-face -face students. And I, I thought it was fun to have a little bit of creativity. So um, I've prepared material for the students to read before and then they ask questions and um, something that Alistair mentioned the other day, I'm actually going to get students to write an exam question so that they understand um, the complexities within that and um, hopefully how to answer them. Next slide, please. I think we're all concerned about these things. Uh, <laughs> um, what if the technology doesn't work? Am I competent enough to use it? If it fails, how are the students gonna cope? Um, it's a natural thing to be concerned about. What about this barrier to participating fully so if students don't engage with the pre-work, if they don't do the reading, etc., are they fully prepared to take part? Likewise, uh, some people, um, possibly with learning difficulties as well, are um, not very keen on taking part in discussions sometimes. So that could be a barrier as far as I was concerned. And I always think about the learning experience. So this possibly does push people's comfort zones, but mostly it's in a good way. So um, I make no apologies for that and I do explain this to the students. Next slide, please. <laughs> So when I um, propose the flip lecture, I generally do it a week before I'm going to do the flip lecture. And um, I've asked the students what their thoughts are, and you can see some comments there. Um, they're pretty good, actually. They're, they're very um, motivated. They're very enthusiastic. So this works well for us in our environment. Next slide, please. This is the crucial thing for me about preparation. So I tell the students exactly what's required of them. So they must do the reading beforehand. And what I also get them to do is to come up with a question. And we then put those questions on the board. Um, I've got some examples later. And then we go through and answer them collectively. So it, it's very inclusive and it does foster discussion but the pre pre preparation has to be there in the first place. Um, so I've explained why we're doing the, the flipping to the students so they understand the, um, the rationale um, and it does help for, the, for that to um, engage students so they do the pre-reading um, to optimize the experience. I have told them they need to raise a question and we will put those on the board and discuss it. And I've told them in advance that I'd like to see an exam question from them. And the technology we use, um, they're fairly used to, but just again to remind them that we'll be using Panopto with a live stream, but also uh, Blackboard Collaborate so that we can have live interaction with the distance learners. Next slide, please. 
so how did it work um is me um i've changed this now so when the students have questions we do that through powerpoint but and when i first started we were just writing them on the board there and just going through and discussing them and at the same time i can get feedback um, from the students next slide please what about the outcomes then um yes active learning um definitely happens students really engage with it um, they they have thought this is a great idea they wish um, other lecturers to do the same sort of thing so i'm not popular in that front but never mind um, absolutely inclusivity so it, it did blend everyone together um, we could hear the distance learners live through the microphones and it worked really really well Creativity, absolutely. Um, students actually had discussions amongst themselves. I was kind of a facilitator at some times. So that I was really pleased with those results. Uh, understanding of exam questions, well, that's to, to be decided. Um, I'm doing my flip lecture on Monday and this is where they'll be doing the, question, the exam question. So that's a new initiative for me. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Next slide, please. What about the technology? Well, we're lucky that um, so far everything's worked well. It's quite robust. Um, you know, we're just using Moodle and Panopto and they're very, very good platforms. Not all the students engaged uh, with the pre-work. They didn't do the reading and therefore couldn't really fully participate in a sense, but they did ad hoc some questions during the live session. So, they caught up um, and again it's the usual reasons we heard some earlier on about not having time or you know just just other commitments so we we i have to be very mindful of that with our particular students um, <clears throat> there was great dialogue between myself and the students and within the student group as well so i was very happy with that um, more so than normally um, we encounter so that's great they were a bit shy at first about this, um, is it a comfortable learning experience? Um, it's obviously something very different for them. It's pushing their comfort zones, but the overall feedback was very, very positive. Next slide, please. So just to show you, I've got some um, two, two other presentations here. One is sh just showing some feedback from the students Okay, yep. Um, I don't know if you can read all these, but uh, I've just got some students to make some comments. Um, you can see these. I think they'll be embedded in the presentation anyway. Um, but these were all very positive. Uh, even some students questioned whether they had the ability to, to ask reasonable questions. They found it quite difficult to come up with questions, which I found interesting. But they were overall very positive. And in terms of the presentation, um, I prepared a um, PowerPoint, a normal kind of lecture. So there were certain things highlighted so we could discuss those in, in class, etc. This brings into question some of the accessibility. So these were PDF documents, uh, which are notoriously bad. <laughs> so I need to look at some of these, but um, we, we we kind of get around that a little bit with these discussions, but yeah, there are some issues with the material. So I am doing this, I am enjoying doing this, but it is in a very limited capacity, um, basically because I don't want to put too much um, strain on the students to do all the pre-work. If this was full-time university, uh, I think it would work very, very well for a larger proportion of my lectures. And um, yeah, I'll close there. I think that's um, all I need to say. Um, I hope it's uh, inspired some people that may be thinking about this, worrying about it. I've started a very low key and a very small scale. So for us, it works. Uh, if you've got 200 people in a class i'm not sure perhaps we're here later on about that um steve yeah. thank you thank yeah. you very much that's been really helpful um 
And if you've got questions for Steve, hold them for the minute because we're going to have a, a slot. We've got about 10 minutes after Mary Jane's spoken where we'll be able to discuss both of these presentations and ask questions there. So, okay. Mary Jane, thank you. Yes, all right, here we go. Uh, let me just share and get started. All right, so um, um, I think it is a good follow on from uh, what we just heard. I am teaching in a full time university. So the context is a bit different. And uh, I'm really l uh, looking forward to your questions and thoughts on sort of how these two uh, presentations are related. Anyway, so in our brief time together, I'm going to focus on some key aspects, beginning with some of the lessons and ideas I've taken away from the original FLIP webinar in April 2017, then what I believe to be four core principles of flipping, and finally, why the teacher is the key. Okay, so some thoughts on the original. Um, there are as many different kinds of FLIP classes as there are teachers and classes. Different disciplinary contexts, uh, chemistry, languages, um, what we just heard about, a wide range of teaching and learning contexts from kindergarten through higher education, continuing professional develop, uh, evening classes, uh, and many kinds of different learners. So flipping will look different in different disciplines and kinds of courses. Um, if we conceive of flipping as a continuum of different practices supported by technology, so for example, partial flipping, as David Reed mentioned in the 2017 webinar, we can see there are many ways to flip. Um, this continuum uses the stages of Puente Fura's SAMR model. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I've also included that. So, um, um, in this way, it's not a progression, but rather a continuum. And we can view flipping not as an all or nothing, high stakes reorientation of our teaching approach, but rather as an array of choices and affordances from which we can choose. Um, and then this is the SAMR model, and that's in the presentation. If you're not familiar with it, you can go and go back and have a look at that. Um, okay, so. Um, in the uh, original presentation also, um, quite a number of participants flagged the problem and it was just mentioned again. It's a recurring theme. Student buy-in, for example, not doing the task before, before class. Fear that the students will balk at the extra time for online tasks. Uh, their expectations of being recipients rather than active or constructivist learners. So these can be boiled down to the fear that students simply will not cooperate and hold up their end. But isn't student resistance an Achilles heel of all teaching to a greater or lesser extent? And uh, judging from the vast literature on student motivation, this fear is not unique to flipping. Think about the last time you introduced a new lesson or task. Did you wonder how will students react? Will it work out as I planned? And perhaps it's because we as teachers are looking afresh at our teaching practices here with flip learning that the role of learners also comes into play. Could it be that because the learner's active role in their own learning is highlighted in flip learning that it is also problematized? So both roles, teacher and learner, are impacted as a result of flipping. If teaching practices change, so must learning practices, um, which is the third takeaway. So changes to practice are called for, and this will involve commitments of time and effort, not only regarding the technologies themselves, but our pedagogical practices, many of which we have held dear semester after semester. And that's not a bad thing, of course, but it does require critical reflection to change or, um, shall we say, develop these practices in new directions. Uh, and finally, flipping, flip teaching uh, practice needs at its core to be teaching practice. And this is a quote from the 2017 um, uh, webinar. So some basic principles to draw. Um, first of all, flipping is about schema activation. We do not learn starting from a tabula rasa, but rather based on our current knowledges and experiences. 
Having learners arrive in the physical classroom with these existing schema activated and ready to build upon is one of the most powerful aspects of flipping. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy, and I've just uh, offered a slide there, it also helps us understand good flipping. So in my field, for example, which is um, language teaching, the foundation of language learning is the base of Bloom's, and that is comprehension and knowledge. For example, key vocabulary or pragmatic structures the learner must have at her disposal if she's to reach the higher levels through collaboration. So um, going back uh, here, the, um, the second point that the flip learner has to take on a more active role in the teaching learning relationship. And this also means that the teacher has to support and enable greater learner autonomy and empowerment to make flipping work. And that's a webinar topic in itself, of course. So finally, critical digital uh, literacy. Um, uh, there's a great deal of literature and research on this topic, but very briefly, critical digital literacy is a tongue twister. It's the idea that our students also need to learn how to engage with, access, and use resources in the digital realm in meaningful and constructive ways. And we need to encourage them to be critical and evaluative about what they find on the internet. And this is an essential aspect of 21st century literacies. So rather than erasing the need for teachers and teaching, in fact, the teacher's role is more important than it has ever been. And the link on this slide includes workshop materials and other resources. And I would also recommend Morrison Stommel's book, An Urgency of Teachers, if you're interested in this topic. So. Um, let's go to some, um, uh, uh, this framework uh, that I've created or that I can offer. So the first thing to consider is that in the flip classroom is a hybrid space and it comprises a virtual and a physical space. Both of these come with assumptions and beliefs as well as habits and ingrained behavior. So what are some of the characteristics of the virtual space? It's open, chaotic, it has no boundaries. It's populated with cat videos, social networks, and other distractions. The classroom space is bounded in time and space. Its practices and behaviors in this classroom are learned and come with a tradition. And of course, it's face-to-face. -face. So uh, I'm going to share with you this framework. Uh, this framework, uh, which is really just three columns, um, can help us plan, structure, and implement a flipped lesson. And there should be a worksheet based on this uh, in the materials that I've provided. So I'm going to skip this one and go right here, which is an accessible framework uh, Lillian has helped me to to make um, and this is an example of a flip lesson that I use with a B2 level interdisciplinary English for specific purposes course for students of engineering and natural sciences at the Technical University Berlin um, I don't know that we have a lot of time today uh, to go into all of these but you can for example um, uh, let me escape this and go here. Um, look at this yourselves. Um, this is all embedded in, 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 um, with Google, uh, Google Docs. And you can go and look at this whenever you like. Um, so I'll just say one thing uh, about how it's structured. So weekly notes um, is how I begin every week because uh, students will be working in the open, boundless space of the internet. They'll be in the wild and the tasks need to be structured and clear. So they need to access these first at the start of each new week. And in addition to fostering learner autonomy, um, it describes expectations. There should be a time frame provided um, um, so that learners know exactly how much is required. There should be questions to get them thinking um, and to activate their schema and begin the work of constructing new knowledge. And there should be clear information about how this knowledge uh, will be used in the face-to-face -face classroom. So there may be, um, um, Oh, weekly notes, hold on here, where are we here? So yeah, so then structured tasks should be provided before class, 
Um, and f this is an example of a video with a worksheet. And students can take as much time as they need to complete it, which of course is another advantage of flipped learning. And this task should build a bridge to the in-class activities, for example, by asking students to jot down some notes for discussion. Uh, and then in class, uh, they can arrive in the face-to-face -face class with ideas and questions about the topic. Um, and these form the base of Bloom's taxonomy. All right, I've got one more minute. These are available to you uh, to take a look at whenever you like. And um, I just wanted to add that this particular task is one that I used long before I started flipping. And um, so you can, um, you know, adapt um, uh, your um, uh, uh, tasks and, and materials that you already have. So I've also included in here some, an overview of literature, which we don't really have time for, but that you can take a look at as well. Um, and my focus is on the role of the teacher, and that's you. And um, in the end, it's we teachers who adapt and change our practices to fit new modes of literacy and learning. And to do this, we must continue to develop as learners ourselves, which is, of course, why we're all here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. <clears throat> and I, I feel very much more cultured after that session. I haven't seen <laughs> Achilles heels and Sisyphean tasks. <clears throat> so there's um, lots of things for us to think about. And um, what we're going to do now, I'm just going to very briefly uh, just introduce you to this task and because this is the point where we want you to discuss we've got 46 people um, participating at the moment so we'd like you to be able to give some comments um, I, I'll probably structure this in one of, in two halves so we'll do five minutes or so general generic comments um, about what you've heard asking questions responding to yeah that worked really well with for me as well those sorts of things and then towards the end of it um i'll try to focus us much more towards that bit about maximizing accessibility what is there we, we've touched on that steve touched on that um and mary jane touched on that but we'll we'll look again at that a little later but to start off with generic points what did you like about what you've seen what would you like to know more about what barriers would you anticipate what questions do you have to ask over to you so use the text chat for that i think it was very interesting in the registration as well that someone said they run a wholly flipped he degree apprenticeship it'd be great if they could identify themselves and and uh fill in our gaps on, on understanding what that, that means. And someone else said they've tried this and it did not work. And that's like really, really broad. Um, how did they try it? How much did they try? What happened? And there's so much we could unpack on that as well. I think that's a really interesting point. And again, we, you know, just because we're chatting because we've got our microphones open, please do mm. put your own comments in don't stop and listen to us because what we have to say may not be very important compared to what you have to say so get what get your points down but um i think that's is this whole thing in teaching and learning because it's a very multi-layered multi-dimensional complex um activity it's very easy for something to go wrong because one of the ingredients wasn't right and it's not that the recipe is wrong it's just that that particular ingredient you know there was too much of it too little of it you know mm. baked at the wrong temperature whatever metaphors you want to use mm. so we've got lots of stuff coming in here i c i can see who it was that responded with um we run the whole leaf flipped but i'll i'll allow them to to volunteer if they want to speak about that they're still with us mm. And they can unmute themselves, presumably. Mm. So Gareth's got a good question, which either Steve or, for, or MJ might like to answer. Was there any difference in the quality of student output after implementing flipped and, and how was that measured? <laughs> That's a, a really difficult one to um, get right. But I, I think if I look at the student experience, they gained in confidence more than anything. Um, and they, they are... Um, better able to put forward an argument so for me 
it's very difficult to measure, but I look at the student performance and, and how they reacted. Yeah, and I would agree with that. Um, I do see more engagement and I do do a, um, a, a survey at the end of every semester that I've been doing for quite a number of semesters and students themselves feel that they have learned more and that they're mo have more confidence speaking English and um, developing, you know, all of the things that they need, uh, the competencies that they need. So I think that's pretty good um, uh, evidence. There's some interesting questions. Uh, Gareth's asked a question here. I mean, there's lots of other interesting questions as well. I'm just going to pick out Gareth's because I think there's others uh, responding to that. Was there any difference in the quality of student output after implementing flipped? And how did you measure it for either of you? I thought we just done that one. <laughs> What's the, qu I'm sorry, I missed the question. How did, how did you measure the quality of student output? Sorry, I might have been, you may have yeah, done it and I was yeah. reading the text. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was <laughs> trying to find to it. Um, I think, you know, as I said, I do ask students themselves um, if how they feel about um, what they learned and if it, it supported their learning. So, um, you know, I can, I, we use a sort of, we don't use uh, ex exams and things like that. We use um, sort of, um, uh, presentations and that sort of um, assessment at the end, continuous assessment. So I don't have, you know, test scores that I can point to, but um, I can anecdotally attest to um, just a, a better performance and more, more confidence by students. I, they're, 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 they're more active in the classroom and that I can directly observe. What's interesting is there's several points coming in about the importance of scaffolding and some, some very positive comments about the kind of scaffolding that both of you talked about. Um, and I wonder to, to what extent the scaffolding is doing the trick rather than the flipping. Maybe if we had other lessons that weren't flipped but were just as well scaffolded do you think that would have the same impact or do you think it's a, something slightly different and added that you're giving as well yeah i, I think in um, from my perspective i i give students lecture notes before the lecture anyway yeah. but they don't necessarily feel compelled to read them before the lecture so doing the flip lecture they definitely engage more yeah. They definitely do some pre-reading and that results in great discussions within the class. Rather than being in, a, in like in a passive environment, they're actually doing an active role and, and learning. So I personally think the pressure of making them read it and, and prepare questions and even think about the exam question is far more beneficial than them just reading the notes on their own because they don't do it fully. They don't engage as well. <laughs> Okay, that's very helpful. Um, there's some lots of other questions coming in there that uh, people are responding to uh, themselves and, or other people are responding to one another. So I'll let that continue. I'm mm -hmm. just going to very briefly perhaps focus in on accessibility issues. So Steve, you talked about you know a PDF and the fact that some of your content that people are looking at before the session might have some accessibility barriers. What, you know, I mean, if you can speak very personally for the minute, what would you need to be able to, what would you feel that you needed to be able to be empowered to do something different? Support. <laughs> um, you know, we, like everybody, our time is very limited um, to try new options, etc. But I think with the impetus of um, the accessibility laws, etc., we, we've got to change. And it's great to see what other people are doing to, uh, in terms of good practice, to to overcome this. But in, in my lectures, obviously, we started some of this material a long time ago. We embed animations, we embed video, we embed audio, and that doesn't necessarily um, help with accessibility but to change it all into a you know a, a perfect accessible document I need some support and unfortunately we don't get it very often. What, what's interesting is that I think you do embed huge inclusion from those things you've talked about you know I put in video put in podcasts etc lots of inclusion there I suppose the issue is that some of those 
barriers that you reduce for some students without um, other accessibility practices may create vulnerabilities for, for different students and that's where the support and the guidance is needed I guess. Yeah very much so and um, just just even if you think about the transcripts of the small videos if we put in there etc um, yeah. <laughs> okay um, Lillian you had something when we talked beforehand oh I'm just just going to go into sting in the tail and about now but uh, Lillian you had something when we talked beforehand about PDFs that you had quite a lot um, of conversations with staff um, yeah I think the, the the interesting thing is that staff are very um, worried that um, students will edit um, their work somehow, even though the copy on the VLE can't be edited by students, they worry that the students will download it and edit it. And I'm like, I don't understand. Isn't that the point? The students are making notes anyway. Um, but they worry that the students will mistype or delete something and therefore think that they have to write 500 words instead of 5,000. So, so there's all these all, all this fear um, that that they've got. But the other thing um, that is proving difficult to shift some of the PDF practice is that learners have learned to work with the bad PDFs they have. So um, I have tutors going, oh, my visually disabled student says he prefers the PDFs. Well, he prefers the PDFs because he's found a way to use open office to make an editable document. And he can therefore use it as a normal kind of writing document. So it's not that he prefers PDFs, it, it's just that he's got used to that practice. Um, so those two different, you know, things that make it hard to persuade people to leave um, the practice of using PDFs as the resource. That's, that's great, that's really helpful. We, can t we could talk for a long time about PDFs and uh, keep, uh, keep your eye on the Digital Accessibility Regulations Gismail list if you want to continue these conversations on PDFs. Next slide, sting in the tail. I just want to mention that that's here. I won't go over it in any detail now other than to say that flipped learning is not universally enjoyed by students for a variety of reasons. And Julian Hopkins um, earlier in the mailing list uh, gave us, uh, well, alerted us to this really interesting paper from last year. And, um, and it showed that students tended to prefer passive learning over active learning. There's some reasons for that, but critically, explaining and managing student expectations and scaffolding the task was the thing that made the difference between them preferring passive or preferring active. So over to Ron now, I think. <laughs> well, we just got a, a few um, last points to make and then a, a final activity for everybody. Um, so if you're familiar with these resources, you'll see that we create them using the tool called Xerti and there's this page that explains that and we usually try to add a, a contextualization as to the particular topic we're covering at the time. We share these as a Creative Commons license and you can see that detail there and the and the direct link to the home page. And in fact, if I just jump from here to the, the first page, for those that didn't do the homework, we skipped past when we started this reactivated version of the webinar, we skipped past quite a number of the pages. So uh, what was it? Um, 14 pages prior to the one that we started with today. So um, there's quite a lot there for you to, to recap on and, and have self access to. Um, next steps, um, join our mailing list if you haven't already, post a message and reflections and further reflections after the webinar via the mailing list. But more importantly, if you're interested, like our two great guest speakers today, if you're interested in sharing your experience, the next topic is knowing what they know, getting feedback from students. There's the previous recording and the resource available, and it, we'd really like to hear from um, two or three people um, that are keen to share their experience, just like um, Mary Jane and Steve have done today. Um, so um, we also have these journeys that are mini courses that um, we referred to it earlier in the, the session that there's a step by step guide as to where you can go and join those um, journeys. And there's a journey specifically on flip learning. 
Um, this is us and some further information about us. And if you, if you like what we cover in these webinars and want to kind of get help with rolling the same kind of CPD sessions out in your own institutions, then we'd be keen to hear from you. And the last activity for everybody is what one thing will you do as a result of what we've covered today? Um, I'll put the link in the text chat. So again, it's a case of not trying to type in wrong on my screen, <laughs> yes. um, but to do it <clears throat> on your screen. Did you, did you want to say anything about the text wall interaction, Lillian? Um, just that it's um, 320 characters to keep things brief. Uh, and uh, don't feel you have to keep submitting. If you press submit once and nothing's changed, just wait for the screen to refresh. Penny has been trying to log into the uh, flipped learning journey on Pedit, I think, uh, but she can't see a registration uh, button. Uh, I can't go to that and share my screen at the same time. No, no. We'll 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 come back to that when we've um, when we've managed to. Well, actually, um, people don't need to see my screen. That's that's the more confusion bit, isn't it? So as people are typing to that, I'll see if I can quickly go to. Uh, So I think text wall might be slowing down with um, with lots of people typing in at the same time. I've Either that was the Xerti object that's there, uh, because we're all on the same page, aren't we? That's true, yeah. yeah. They're coming through, but I've pressed submit. And it's so tempting. I've pressed submit, and it hasn't changed. And I, it's I tempting to, to press it I again. I want to press it again. I yeah. so want to press it again. Yeah but I will refrain. We might need to stop embedding it into the Xerti. I think yeah, it works it better when it's not actually embedded or maybe yeah. provide people with a link to jump straight out to post. It's, let, it's finally we, told me it's We posted. should explain though that part of the reason we do this rather than uh, we have in previous webinars used the text chat area for this kind of feedback, yeah. but then it's not so easily um, embedded within the resource for people to yeah. review afterwards. And also contributions can continue after the session with this yeah, absolutely. whereas with the text chat that can't so yeah so this supports flip learning in a sense you know Indeed. it allows people to do it in an asynchronous fashion um but obviously we're we're using it synchronously right now and the other thing to to remember is that because these are um, Creative Commons resources and they are free for you to use, we've only looked at, I think, slide from slide 18 to 28 uh, were the ones we looked at today. Um, there's all the previous 1 to 18 where you can look at. There's activities embedded in there. There's resources embedded in there. Uh, there's examples. There's little video clips of other people's practice. Do use this with your own staff training. Um, you know, you're welcome to use these dirty resources. Um, and if you want help with adapting it to your specific contexts, uh, there was a note here, somebody's going to look at whether Xerti would support. That's the sort of thing that, you know, any of us could help you with. So you could have your own bespoke resources based on these resources with your own links and so on uh, embedded into it. So feel free to do it yourself or to get some support in doing it. Yeah, Anna, we will be sharing the link for this webinar um, in the same place where you signed up for it. So I'm going to uh, okay, I'm going to put the link in the text chat. That's our regular place, basically. So long as you come back to um, our regular page, FT30 UK. Uh, uh, oh, FT. Oh, I've got that wrong. Hang on, I've typed that wrong. FT30 UK page. It was slightly back to front. Oh, that time lucky people. FT30 <laughs> UK page. There you go. I'm like you, Alistair. I feel very cerebral after having listened to both Steve and, and MJ's um, uh, 
discussions and explanation and 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 with MJ's uh, links, I'm definitely going to go and follow uh, through some of that literature because uh, a lot of people said they wanted to explore the evidence and and so you know MJ's links. Um, what I really like about them is that the evidence is about going back to basics, like we said with Deslorius, um, looking at the fact that it's about active learning. But the other um, aspect is to look at motivations literature, you know, what helps uh, learners, what motivates learners to participate before they come to class. And if you can find um, and, and spend more time asking the learners what motivated we didn't do this did we what motivated you to participate you know then you start to find the nuggets that will kind of um, encourage more people um, to to kind of uh, engage before um, the actual lecture or seminar yeah uh, larissa I, I guess you mean that the the page that i'm sharing on screen now wasn't working via the short url that uh, Lillian gave so I put the the long link in the text chat if you visit that and then bookmark it um, then you will have access to all of the resources and for those that are seeing my screen now we we have this long list of previous sessions and what we're doing now with these reactivated sessions is revisiting them so in the case of online learning we did that last time flip learning today and in a month's time knowing what they know and then the resources for each of those will be embedded. So the registration will be form will be gone from this page, and then you'll see the previous recording and today's recording um, as soon as I can find time to make that available, which will probably be early next week, and we'll publicise that via our mailing list. I think it'd, it'd be quite useful. We've got a couple of minutes now. If any, anyone can kind of think about when they last did something before the live session. So I don't know, um, I sometimes manage to find the time to review the minutes of the last meeting before I attend a meeting, but I don't always manage. What, what were those times when I managed to do that? It's when I actually bothered to make a specific commitment to do it. I timetabled it, I put it in my calendar. And I wonder if our instruction to students like, read this before the next lecture is too broad and not specific enough um, to make the action actually happen. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like at the end of a lecture saying, right, open up your diaries, everyone, and put a slot in when you are going to do this work. I wonder if that's going to, what do people think who are currently face to face with students now while people are doing that um, I think one of the things that's also worth mentioning which we haven't really discussed today is that the fact that changing to a, a new uh, approach is a risk and when I was doing flipped learning we had a whole module that we flipped and it was terrifying for us because the students had an exam in January and when we took in their files at the end of you know the sort of autumn term just to have a look through their files some files had virtually nothing in it because the students hadn't been very good at making notes others they just printed off everything and they had huge piles of unsorted paper and it was really worrying for us it, you know we thought this could this could go so badly wrong but we had a lot of support um, at management level to say yeah we're going to trust you to run with this and, and see what happens and I think you need to have that buy-in from managers that if you're going to innovate you have to risk and sometimes risks pay off and sometimes they don't and sometimes they pay off amazingly for some students but not so much for others but that's part of you know what innovation's about so you know do do have those conversations with managers and make sure that you're not so risk averse that you can't practice something that might be transformative for students I'd like to see if anyone does manage. Um, I don't know that the, uh, there's anything in the literature about it, but I've asked a couple of my departments to consider timetabling students to turn up half an hour before for a bit of peer learning activity. So that's kind of like do your homework <laughs> before the actual lesson. Because if the students 
get into that habit and it's all about habits and they know that other students are going to be there so it's a bit more of a social space as well um that that could change some of their mindset or, or that could help scaffold and structure their learning a little bit better like like MJ says, you know, you're fighting against the cat videos or the, the fact that you might send them off to YouTube to look at something and then they're distracted by something else. But when they're together, they're more likely to be hopefully a little bit more focused. We don't know. They, they might just use the time to catch up, but that still does something for your class. Having students who are familiar or, or, or um, happy to chat to each other can help that class atmosphere as well. I like the, the point here Emily's made about including a task which the tutor can see very quickly whether or not it's been completed mm. before the session. Um, yeah, so even like a voting, a quick vote, you know, quick. Well, I sometimes, gave, I sometimes gave students um, pre-session quizzes, online quizzes that they had to get 100% on before they came because basically there was a certain amount of mastery learning. If they didn't know the vocabulary, they didn't know the concepts, etc. then I knew that what we were doing in the lesson wouldn't be helpful. Mm. So, and that was something, it was quite easy to say, you know, just to, you know, bring, in those, that was before learning analytics. So in those days, it was bring me the printout of, of your 100% score and I'll let you in the, in the room. Um, which was... I, I've got a good paper on that actually, Suzanne Vogel. Um, uh, let me look it up. Uh, I will paste it in the text chat when I get. We, we also it. talked about breaking the task down into the must do, should yeah. do, could do. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. a very good technique because then, the, again, it's all about perception and mindsets, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of psychology there that the student kind of goes, oh. I can at least do the minimal. And actually the minimal is what you really want the students to yeah, do. Yeah. But you've differentiated and allowed the students to feel like they're getting away with the minimal. But that is the flipped work. That, that's a really good. I'm going to it. stop the recording now. But um, as always, we, we have a little bit of an informal chat as people are leaving. Perhaps before we stop the recording, can we just have on record? Thank you very much, Mary Jane and Steve for excellent inputs and um, if anybody's interested in next session do get in touch good point Alastair thanks very much Mary Jane and Steve okay I've got my uh